our next guest has logged more than his share of air miles as Canada's longest continuously serving foreign correspondent. He spent this past year in 17 different countries, from the battle for Mosul in Iraq to covering an atrocious story out of the Philippines which affected him personally. Matthew Fisher, Post Media's international affairs columnist, is back for his annual visit to the agenda to talk about the year that was and to look ahead to the fault lines of 2017. And as always, Matthew, it's great to have you in that chair. Nice to see you again. 17 Stephen. countries, eh? Yeah, 17. It was a bit slower pace, actually, uh, <laughs> this year. But, but still, um, uh, I was out in quite a few interesting places, including for the Olympic Games uh, in South America and, uh, and also traveled with the Prime Minister twice uh, in Asia and in uh, Europe uh, to get a sense of what he was up to. So uh, a, a, a variety of topics. Let's get into this then. In terms of how messed up the world looked to you this past year compared to other years in the past, what would you say? Well, you know that I'm a skeptic, a cynic, and I have been for a long time. And every year I predict things will get worse than they seem to. It's a pretty safe prediction. I can make the same prediction again now looking forward. Uh, last year, of, uh, of course, a lot of this has to do with Donald Trump. Uh, certainly that's what the public thinks all over the world, but it isn't only Donald Trump that has complicated the world further. Uh, it was some of the things that President Obama did uh, or didn't do that allowed Russia to really leverage things for itself uh, in the Middle East, uh, in Syria in particular, uh, and also some of the things that it has been doing constantly uh, in Eastern Europe. It's what China is doing, more and more assertive behavior uh, in Asia, uh, there are also dangers about China in terms of its economy. And if it melts down, what that might mean for China and for, for everyone else, and there are a few danger signs. So there are all those problems. And the Middle East, of course, mm -hmm. <laughs> every which way but loose, there are problems Always there. bad news out of the Middle East. But I'm not sure any of that would come as a surprise to anybody who covers foreign affairs. What happened last year that you looked at and said, oh, didn't see that coming? Not much, I'm afraid. It's all sort of evolutionary. It, it, and in a way, you're right, it, it is predictable. Uh, the, the thing is, Canadians don't pay much attention to that. Certainly our government doesn't. If you listen to our government, everything is wonderful. It's all sweetness and life and light and Canada will be a moderating force in the world. This is, of course, totally ridiculous. But that is the well, line. Why, why is that totally ridiculous? Because nobody ever pays any attention to Canada. Actually, can I tell again. you something? We did a program here not too long ago in which we sat around and talked about who the most significant leaders with significant influence in the world were today. And somebody said, you know who the most popular leader in the world is today, in the whole world? And somebody else said, Justin Trudeau. And I know you're shaking your head, but you know what? Among liberal democracies, when you no, look around the world... liberals in liberal democracies, and they are in retreat everywhere, Steve. Well, who's a more popular leader in the world today? Angela Merkel still gets a lot of support and votes in Western Europe. After that, I think you're, uh, you're jumping off a cliff. No country, Canada is isolated. Canada is the only country. Just because the Guardian newspaper continues to write how loved uh, our leader is, does not mean that the world loves or pays attention to us. Uh, we've not shown leadership uh, at all. Uh, we've talked about peacekeeping in Africa. That promise was made now 18 months ago, 20 months ago. The government's been in power 15 months and we still have no policy about what we're going to all do right, well, let me, for let, example. Let me go back a couple of minutes here because you did use a word in an answer a couple of minutes ago and that word was predictable. And I just want to focus on that for a second because when you and I were kids, the world felt dangerous but predictable, right? There was a Cold War and you knew that, you know, yes, there were tens of thousands of missiles facing the right. Soviet Union and the United States, but there was a certain predictability about the way the world unfolded and there were proxy wars mm -hmm. here and there. Would you say the world today is more or less predictable than that? It's, it's, it sounds silly to say it, but it is predictably unpredictable. If you want to look at what happened last year, of course, the rise of some of these right-wing demagogues, uh, not only Donald Trump and some of his ideas, which aren't necessarily right-wing, they're all over the map, but Duterte 
in the Philippines, uh, what has happened in Turkey and with the Turkish leadership. Those things, uh, what happened, we could not predict that Turkey would be locking up so many people, so many journalists, More so many... More authoritarian everywhere. Uh, everywhere. And that is the unpredictability that is predictable, but you can't pick the spots. For example, this year, who will be the new despot? Uh, we can't say, but uh, we know who the old can, ones are. Yeah, and not we, sure who the new ones are. but there probably are going to be some new ones. A lot of countries uh, are in a great state of flux. Well, let's look at some of those countries, and I want to start with Europe. And of course, the danger of your annual visits here is that you're on the record, on tape, saying what you've said. So we get a year later to sort of play your words back to you and see how smart you were. And you did last year as well. And well, we're going to do it again. Well, why break a nice tradition, right? Sheldon, Europe, roll it. Europe is in a total mess. It's not only about the refugees and how they digest all of these people and can they remain tolerant democratic societies. There's uh, uh, Italy is the next Greece. Everything's shaping up for another summer of potential big bailouts and all kinds of diplomatic wrangling. And will Britain leave the European Union? Will the European project even exist? There's that one. It's going to ex uh, accelerate, I think, in the next year. Okay, let's look a year later. Fair to say that those trends that you described have, in fact, accelerated. They have. Italy hasn't been quite as volatile as I thought it would be, but those other things are definitely happening. And the PM uh, resigned. Uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's Brexit has triggered a lot of things in Europe that Canadians are not tracking very closely. Uh, but it is freeing the right-wing movements in other countries uh, to say some pretty outrageous things. And the European project that I talked about in terms of failing, uh, it is closer to death this year than, than last year. And, uh, closer to death or closer to the flu? No, death. 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 The end of the, the European Union. The end of the European Union. If a couple more of those countries bolt, what do you have? What really well, you do you say a couple have? of more countries bolt? Who's bolted? So no one's well, bolted yet. Britain has said it is committed. It is committed uh, through a plebiscite to leaving the union. Sure, they sure uh, look like they're doing everything they possibly can not to have to do that. The current government is trying to do that, but it's a matter of law that they're leaving. Right now they're trying to negotiate uh, the terms. People were as shocked in Europe by that result, frankly, as the Trump result shocked uh, mm. people everywhere, including North America. But do you think they're actually going to invoke Article 50 and then begin negotiating their they, departure? They must. They must. Well, they don't but must. How, it's actually the, the courts how, are considering this all right how now. How and when they do it is something. But the public wants out. The right-wing movements are on the rise in France, in Hungary, um, and in several Eastern European countries. Poland uh, right now is wavering in a number of things. Sweden is far more right-wing than it was. Denmark is far more. When I speak about Canada being isolated, we used to think we were like the Scandinavian nations, Steve. Well... Mm. We're not like the Scandinavian nations much anymore because they have moved considerably to the right on things like immigration, uh, on some human rights issues. Hmm. Uh, it's quite a move. Okay, you just mentioned France in that. Uh, you also mentioned Angela Merkel earlier. So I do want to get a little focus on those two countries because they're both going to have elections in 2017. And tell us, in your view, how critical those elections are to the future of the European project. Well... There are only three players, really, big players in the European Union. They're Britain, France, and Germany. If one of them is going, you say they may not go. I say they go, but it, it, the terms still have to be discussed. That's absolutely true. But if one or other, I, I don't see Germany going, but I see the potential for France to be, to be fractured. And already Germany is carrying a tremendous burden financially for the European Union and also uh, a lot of Europeans are unhappy with Merkel for her policies uh, on immigration, and, and that is a time bomb for her also domestically. We but know, we, I see her muddling through. We know that the Russians hacked 
uh, and affected the American election. We don't know if they affected the outcome of the American election, but they certainly tried to have influence. And they've been doing it like crazy in Europe. They've been doing it in Poland, the Baltic states, and Germany. And they will do it in Germany, maybe a bit less in France. But in Germany, they're going to be doing it in spades this year. Uh, they have been doing it for several years. One of the things about this Russian information warfare, it's really a, an old Soviet technique that's been adapted. Uh, to, uh, to modern ways, and, and they've been doing it. Germany has probably been their number one target, and of course Putin speaks German very well, and it is the country that he is most interested in. He, he, he was most worried about the United States, but his personal interest always is in Germany. Well, and it he's is a, in the neighborhood, after all. It is, and he's a man who loves to c cause mischief, mm -hmm. and he's got the old chancellor, he's got Schroeder in there working with him. Uh, which, is this uh, a running uh, gas problem? Yeah, yeah. He well, well we, he's part of it. He's part not of it. running it. Here's, uh, here's a quote from an article in Politico called Putin's Real Long Game. Let me read an excerpt of this for you. What both administrations, that's Obama's and Trump's, fail to realize is that the West is already at war, whether it wants to be or not. It may not be a war we recognize, but it is a war. This war seeks at home and abroad to erode our values, our democracy, and our institutional strength, to dilute our ability to sort fact from fiction or moral right from wrong, and to convince us to make decisions against our own best interests. You agree with that? 110%. Huh. Uh, Russia is an implacable foe. It's trying to get at us in every way it can. And militarily, it has extreme limitations. It can do a few things in Syria. It, it can do things in Crimea because Obama, fr fr frankly, has been totally asleep at the switch. But Trump may check him on that, given who Trump's advisors are. But information warfare is still something, and they're very, very good at it. When I was at the Sochi Olympics, I met a number of Russians who work in that world. And they were telling me at that time that thousands of people were being hired for this, thousands. And I believe now tens of thousands of Russians are devoted to this cause. How many people in Canada or the United States are devoted to uh, in disinformation against Russia? I, probably a handful, maybe a hundred or two hundred, but it isn't thousands. This, Russia has discovered a way that it can really affect things for very little cost, and also they've found that they're in a security environment where nobody calls them on it. Obama mm -hmm. certainly hasn't called them on. Europe is split about what to do about Russia. One moment they want to be tough, the next moment uh, they want to appease Russia. A lot of Russian business companies, the, the large corporations, companies such as Mercedes, they want to do business with Russia. They put Merkel under pressure. So uh, Russia takes advantage of all of these things. And uh, it, the surprise is that we're surprised today about this because it really has been going on for quite some time and goes way back to the 80s in terms of the actual tactics. Let me focus on the American relationship. It's pretty clear that the intelligence community in the United States and the new president of the United States are on very different pages as it relates to Russia. What's going to give there? Trump. He's going to change his ways. He still has to work with a Democrat, with a Republican Congress, with a Republican Senate, and look at the advisors he brought in. I, I have met Flynn, who's his national security advisor. Michael Flynn. Yeah, and I've met uh, General Mattis, uh, General Mattis, and he uh, uh, and Flynn are not soft on Russia. They say, oh the yeah, Secretary, Flynn gave speeches what about in Tillerson? Russia. The incoming Secretary of State is. Uh, It'd be interesting to got listen the to his. Uh, yeah, sure he did. Uh, so did John Chrétien, didn't he? Um, they, uh, they. He got Russia's highest civilian award for being a. A good friend a to good, the Russian people. He, he absolutely did. But we'll listen to these confirmation hearings to see how much he goes back. The American uh, intelligence community, the American military community, and those congressmen and senators, uh, uh, there are a lot of them, not just Republicans, Democrats, are very upset about what Russia's doing. That will limit... Uh, Trump can tweet what he wants, but a lot of this stuff doesn't come under executive order, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. th they still have power, uh, congressmen and senators. Yep. Okay, let's see what you had to say uh, a year ago about Justin Trudeau's admittedly at the time very new government. They've only been in about 15 months now, but here's what you said back then. Sheldon, roll it please. 
Most countries in the world have been moving to the right. Canada has not moved to the right. And in terms of foreign policy, uh, Canada, uh, under the new government, is talking about uh, a very different attitude towards the world. Well, that's fine. But we also have allies, we also have relationships. And right now, those relationships, even in the three months this government has been in power, has frayed a lot. And in fact, coincidentally, just today, Canada gets a new foreign minister in Christia Freeland, who represents a riding about 10 minutes south of here. What do you see on the horizon? Trouble, trouble, trouble. I, the Liberals invested so much in this alleged friendship with Barack Obama, avoiding the fact that when he came to speak in Parliament and said, the world needs more Canada, what he was really saying was he wanted Canada to do more for NATO and do more militarily. That's the Canada he wanted more of, but that part of his message seems to have been missed. So much was invested in a Hillary Clinton presidency, and now they have to be scrambling. Well, they're pivoting. Uh, pivoting, well, uh, they're, uh, they say Trump likes Russia. Well, Chrystia Freeland is an extreme opponent of Russia. Yeah. It's in her bones. She grew up thinking She's that Ukrainian, way, yeah. and she has deep ties in Ukraine. Uh, I've known her for quite some time. I, I like her very much, uh, and I like a lot of her ideas about the world. But her ideas have not been the ideas that the Prime Minister has expressed. And so it'll be very interesting to see. Also, trade has been what she's been doing, but what Trump wants is uh, uh, trade relationships that are transactional. And so what he's going to say for those jobs in Oshawa, for example, is what are you going, if I preserve those jobs for you, what are you going to give me? I don't think Canada's very well prepared for this. What Canada has been doing, it's opened its door to China. We have no security policy to deal with China whatsoever, but it's open door. It's trade, 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 trade. And, uh, we should look at Australia as an example of how that can go wrong, but also Trump is talking very tough about China. He's talking about building up the U.S. Navy and going out there to do things. It wouldn't surprise me in the next year if we have some kind of real showdown over those uh, artificial islands that they've built. What is Canada's policy on any of this except to trade and welcome Chinese investment? But the Chinese come here for two reasons. They come here for access through Canada to the U.S. market, which Trump doesn't particularly want, and they come here for our natural resources. And, uh, okay, I'm a little confused here, because on the one hand, you say no one cares what Canada thinks. So if that's the case, why do we need to have policies on a whole range of issues that you seem to think are so important? Because they're important to us, not important to the world. But we get by totally. Canadians underestimate it all the time. But our relations with the United States count for absolutely everything. And they know that. Our, this our, government knows that. Our businessmen have done a poor job. Governments for 20 or 30 years, different trade ministers, Freeland, Jack, uh, or Eddie Fast, before her, Ed Fast, tried very hard to encourage Canadian businessmen to d diversify their interests. It hasn't really hard happened. Hard to do. And the current Liberal government of Canada has actually knocked on the door of former Conservative Prime Minister Brian Mulroney to help them smooth waters in Washington. What do you think of that move? Uh, well, it's okay, but, uh, and they say, well, he lives uh, very close to Trump down in Florida, but uh, it, it won't hurt. But what we need are world-class businessmen, because look at the people Trump has put around him. He's put around him generals and hugely successful businessmen. Where are the hugely successful Canadian businessmen commanding global corporations? We don't have many of them. Uh, our government, uh, our public service, does not like promoting generals into civilian jobs. We have a long, long history of not doing this. And uh, yet all the people that Trump has put around him, those are the two sets. How are we going to talk on a range of issues to the United States? I know it's heresy, and they would laugh at me for saying this in Ottawa, but the Trudeau, or the, uh, Trudeau government would do very well to appoint a few Canadian generals to civilian jobs where we could deal with the U.S., because those are the people who have dealt a lot with the U.S. The president likes his generals, there's no doubt about that. Let's look to the Middle East. ISIS, 2017, what do you see? Well, I just spent some time in Iraq, uh, not a lot, but... They are certainly on their back heels, but they're going down with one heck of a fight. Uh, it is an absolutely bloody war. They are... It's sinister how 
how clever they are and how ferocious they are. They are so ingenious in how they fight. But they are going down in Mosul. Uh, in recent days, finally, there have been a few breakthroughs. The war is not over there. Uh, the war will go on into Syria, but there it's a mess because the Turks are involved, the Russians are involved, the Americans are putting more troops and more advisors into Syria. But there's the new war that ISIL and also the group we've forgotten about, Al-Qaeda, they're back, eh? They're back, eh? Yeah, they're back. Uh, and uh, we're not hearing much about them yet, but uh, there's lots going on in North Africa, and we're already seeing that they're planting agents in Europe. I expect they also have some agents in Canada and the United States. And these terror attacks that we've been, become used to every two, three, or four weeks in some Western capital or in Turkey, there are going to be, I think, double or triple or quadruple the number of those kind of attacks this year. Uh, and we still have not found any effect effective way to deal with this. So they are going to change as a group, but they're not going away. They remain as committed to their idea of destroying Western culture and Western values. And they're also starting to pose a problem for China. Uh, and China's losing some people uh, because of this. And they're posing problems for Russia. Russia's very worried. If we have any common ground with the Chinese and the Russians, it might be in combating Islamic terror. Russia has tens of millions of Muslims. The, the southern part of Russia has quite a few radicals, not just in Chechnya, but in Dagestan, in Ingushetia, and then in all the former Soviet stands. Mm -hmm. And all of this creates problems. Uh, these guys aren't done. They're going to move into Central Asia. They're going to move into Europe. And I imagine they're going to do smaller actions, uh, except maybe in Libya, but okay. Libya, they're not doing too well right we're, now. We're I, not done either. We're going to go move to the Far East, and I want you to talk about what I suspect was the saddest story you had to cover this past year in the Philippines. You lost a friend there. I did. John Risdell uh, was a friend of mine. He was the first of the two Canadians to be beheaded by Abu Sayyaf. He was, he was taken prisoner down in Duterte's own backyard in Davao. Uh, I'd known him for a couple of years. Uh, he's a former journalist, but I didn't know him that way. I knew him as a, as a mining executive. And uh, he was a very decent man. And... Uh, uh, unlike a lot of Canadians, he really could operate in the world. Uh, uh, most Canadians I find ill-suited for the, the, uh, the give and take uh, of the third world, but he was very, very good at it. He was taken while on vacation, and it was a long, drawn-out affair how he died, and Robert Hall, a second Canadian, died. Uh, extremely grisly, uh, and again, these people, although I'm not sure they are, but they claimed a connection to Islamic State. Uh, they're an implacable foe. I went to the spot where he was kidnapped, literally to where his sailboat was bobbing in the water. And uh, to think, it, it's an absolutely gorgeous place where he was, he was taken. To think that you could be seized from there, held in the jungle for months, and of course it presented a conundrum as it does for all Western governments what to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing I do sympathize with the Prime Minister for, he said that that was the most yes. important event for him last year, the most trying, the one that uh, affected his conscience. I should ask this follow-up question because we have a, a huge Philippine community here in Canada. What has happened to that country? They seem to have a madman at the helm now. He said, for example, Hitler massacred three million Jews. There's three million drug addicts in the Philippines and I'd be happy to slaughter them all. Uh, I mean, his math is terrible. There was six million Jews killed in the Holocaust and there's maybe, there, there maybe a, three million. If not maybe half that many drug users in the country. But, but how does a crackpot like that stay in power? Well, a lot of people look at that in terms of Donald Trump and how he Trump's came to power. Trump's never said anything the likes Turkey. of this. No, no, nothing like that. But Filipinos have always liked larger-than-life characters for a while. Marcos was popular at one time. Estrada, the actor, was quite an outrageous, flamboyant character. Duterte is this way. Most Filipinos love what he says about uh, how he's dealing with drug dealers, and they are going out. A very large number of them are being killed. Where he is going to come a cropper, I think, is about China and the United States. The one part of his plan that no Filipino gets is, why are we going to be friends with China? 
we love the United States. Filipinos have that bond. So many Filipinos work in the United States. It's the goal of so many Filipinos to emigrate there. Uh, they regard themselves in so many ways as Americans and uh, or, or aspire to be Americans. And so if he gets in trouble, I think it will be over that issue. He's got to watch his back, too, because the Philippine military is quite powerful and all their ties are the United States. And now he's got the Russian fleet visiting. Uh, he says that uh, that court ruling, the Philippines got everything it wanted from the international court. And now he says that that doesn't matter, that it's okay if the Chinese uh, uh, sit on the Philippines' greatest fishing grounds, the Scarborough Shoal, just to the, to the west of the north part of the Philippine archipelago. It, it, it seems to be madness, his foreign policy. And that is where I think he's going to get in trouble. But right now, his support among the population is absolutely huge. It stuns me. I ask Filipinos all the time. I spend a fair bit of time there. And uh, they love the man. They mm -hmm. love sort of that swagger that he's got. I find with Americans, uh, if you go out into the hinterlands, they like Trump swagger. I know it repels sure. a lot of people, but it's the same sort of idea. And Turks, uh, who like their president, they like his swagger as well, even though when we look at some of the things he does, we, we shake our heads. Authoritarianism is in. It sure is. It's and coming in anyway. Let's, uh, we got a couple of minutes left, and I, and I know you are a, um, you're, you're generally a glass half empty kind of a person. You're, you're, you're a self-acknowledged cynic or skeptic about the way the world works. Can you look out at that map over there, over our shoulders, and find any country anywhere in the world where you think something good is going to happen next year? You're encouraged? Oh, I think some good things are likely to happen in Canada because we have uh, uh, tremendous resources and we have tremendous people. I think the United States, the Trump effect will be, is being exaggerated, the, this paranoia. I think... He won't the, be as bad as everybody thinks. Because even if he wants to be, there are realities that... Checks that, and balances. Uh, that, come, ...that come with power. So I don't think things will be that bad. I, I always look at countries like Canada, once you leave the ma major cities and in New Zealand and Australia, there are great things going on in, in the hinterlands uh, of those countries. But as um, you look at the way, you think Europe's going to be worse, you think the Middle East is going to be worse. Uh, I didn't hear you say We haven't talked about Africa and Canada's kumbaya plans for Africa. Okay, touch on that. Well, and we're doing, it's been 15 months, we still have done nothing about Africa, but even when we do something, it's going to be 600 people that we're sending there. The British and the German media constantly, the French media as well, are on about how everything fails in Africa. The United States, or the United Nations is a, is a disgraceful organization. It can't do anything. Canada's putting everything there. We want that seat in the Security Council. Uh, to get that, we're going to need a, the support of a lot of despots. We need an awful lot of of African dictators. That's where we will get our support to go and do that. And how do we get that support? By getting China's support. But what if China does something terrible in Tibet or in Burma? What is our stance going to be when we're beholden to them for the UN votes that we get? It's very complicated. So finish us off here in our last 20 seconds. Make one prediction about what's going to happen next year so that we can play the tape back next year when you come. The Donald Trump uh, will change the world very significantly significantly, and not necessarily for the worse. I think he's mo going to be more moderate in Russia or, or more tough on Russia uh, than he's saying. And on China, I think he's going to be very tough. Obama was a wonderful man. I, I like him very much, but he did none of that. It is a shame sort of how U.S. foreign policy has been conducted. I actually have some hope because of some of the people that he's put around him. That's Matthew Fisher, Canada's longest continuously serving foreign affairs columnist for Post Media News. Matthew, we always appreciate your annual visits here at TVO. Thanks so much. Thank you, Steve. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.